Welcome to this special edition of the CX Green Room, the show where we go behind the curtain with CX leaders to talk about the biggest trends affecting the industry today. I'm Ginger Conlon, Thought Leadership Director at Genesis. I'm joined by my co-host Claire Beatty, our special guest, and our two special guests for today, David Hung, who is Director of Global Command Operations, Customer Care Workforce Operations for AT&T Communications. And Nicole Sauer, who is Employee Lifecycle and Workforce Transformation for AT&T as well. So welcome, David and Nicole. Let's dive right in with a quick introduction. Um, David and Nicole, please tell us a little bit about yourselves and your role. Yeah, sure. Ladies first. Nicole, you want to go first? Hey, okay. I will do so. So um, yeah, I'm a Director of Employee Lifecycle and um, Strategy for AT&T. So what that means is basically I have the privilege of um, leading a small team who has gotten involved in all aspects of our frontline employee journey. So think pre-hire um, all the way through to like exit interview. So we've had a chance to um, get involved in, in all of those fun things. So yeah, it's been a good ride. Yeah. Hello everyone, nice to meet you virtually. My name is David Hung. Um, as Ginger said, I have the privilege of leading the Global Command Operations Organization, also known as GCO. Um, our organization supports customer care, which comprises of consumer broadband and mobility lines of business. We support about 250 contact centers around the world, mixture of both internal badge as well as strategic vendors. And our goal is to deliver accurate interval requirements. So think of the pillars, volume, HT, staffing, FTE, and ultimately optimize that interval performance. Um, so achieving our answer rate goals, ASA, occupancy, all those good things at the interval level. Well, very warm welcome to you both. Really looking forward to hearing about how you manage um, a contact center operation of, of this size. Uh, this is the CX Green Room, uh, a zone specially reserved for the big hitters in CX, who are a very demanding crowd. So we always ask uh, for a few special items that we can prepare to make them feel very comfortable. I have to say, uh, this was the longest list of special requests we have ever had in the history of the Green Room. So tell us more about your must-have items and what we prepared for you today. I'll go first, David. Your list was longer than mine. Okay. So I had two things because it's Christmas time and you have to have the green and red peanut M&Ms because those are awesome. And then my second green room item has got to be unsweet tea. So you get your sugar out of here and there's no 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 sugar in the tea. Delicious. That's it for me. Two things. Delicious. David, what about you? <laughs> so funny. I have similar things and for the same reason. So um, I've got Celsius. And I've got some patch, right? Celsius, um, I mean, I, I'm bad. Years ago, I was the type that would drink Red Bulls and Monster Energy drinks. I don't know that Celsius is that much better, but it definitely sharpens my mind and focus. Um, and then as I was joking before, when it comes to candy, all forms of candy, but especially Sour Patch, um, depending upon how uh, interesting, how stressful the day goes, I'll just be snacking away at it. So on my worst day, I'll go through an entire bag, you know, so I'm sad to admit that. You, you'll be glad to know that I did get one of my own for oh, today. Good. Just, just for you. Just there for you. Well, in anticipation of this, I went to the store and I bought my own Sour Patch, never having had it before. Um, about an hour ago, I opened them and I was like, I, I, get, I get it. I'm halfway through the pack. They just keep going in. It's so good. And I also have a cup of tea because I'm a Brit and I always have a cup of tea. Never without a cup of tea, basically. And I have made a fancy tray of all, of all of those items. Plus, David had mentioned Diet Dr. Pepper. So that's the center one. <laughs> oh, you, you have to. This, especially three, it, it's all Dr. Pepper. Well, we certainly have enough sugar to power us through the next 20 minutes, no doubt. So very, very thankful for that. So we're here talking today about workforce engagement, the contact center workforce. I think it's worth just remembering 
remembering at this time, uh, the contact center is working absolutely around the clock to make customers happy, solve problems. And we are really appreciative of um, all of the hard work that they do in building customer loyalty. Um, so we also did a big piece of research this year that looked at the contact center workforce. We partnered with MIT Technology Review. Um, and thank you both for participating, your insights into that research. A lot of really interesting trends came out of that report. Um, we saw a big shift towards uh, hybrid working, the need for flexibility, the shift in uh, like employee preferences, uh, really wanting you know, a different way to be employed, um, much more looking at career development and opportunities for advancement. We saw um, that those things are critical to attracting the workforce. We also saw um, a lot of investment in technology and into improving the agent experience day to day. So we'd love to just, you know, ask, ask you, um, maybe start with you, David. Tell us a little bit, like what trends do you see in the workforce? What's shifting and perhaps what are some of the things that are different since COVID if you look at your contact centers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, talk about um, just a, a seismic, unprecedented, um, you know, change, right? The COVID-19 pandemic, it's forever changed the world, um, resulting in significant change in, in both expectations of our employees, uh, companies, consumers. You know, when you think about AT&T, we historically did not have a work from home for our frontline agents before the pandemic. Um, but once the pandemic hit, we, as well as many other large global entities, organizations had to quickly pivot and adapt to a remote environment uh, to mobilize our global workforce. We had to find ways to quickly implement digital solutions um, that gave us the ability to drive a productive and efficient um, remote working environment. And with that, you've obviously got challenges around how do you enable your people? How do you tool them? Um, security, right? Not just protecting our employees, but also our customer uh, data uh, in that virtual, in this virtual environment. Um, you know, we think about how our employee expectations have changed. Um, not only did the pandemic disrupt um, the way that we work, but how people feel about their work. Um, I'm, you know, all of us are, are human, right? And we've all, I mean, think there, there's been nothing else that has connected all of us in terms of this human experience of COVID-19. And, and for all of us, all of our employees, you know, we want a renewed sense of purpose in our work. And with that job flexibility, um, that flexibility has increased in importance um, through the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic, with all of us seeking you know, better work-life balance, um, the ability to work from home, right? See, see my background, right? Um, better balance that fits with um, our, our lives, our families. Um, we want to feel valued. You know, that's nothing new, right? We want to continue to feel valued by being heard, having a sense of belonging, having the potential for advancement and having meaningful work. And so for us, and I, I know my, my, my friend Nicole will talk more about um, you know, things that, that trends we're seeing and things that we're doing on the recruiting and retention front, but, but no surprise, right? At the heart of delivering exceptional customer experiences, um, you want to have employees who are happy and engaged and feel that the work that they do makes a impactful difference, um, not just for their customers, but for their own daily lives. So, um, so to, to some of these new employee expectations, reinforcing some that were already there, but have grown in value. Um, but doing all this, and like you said, a, a hybrid work environment, striking the right balance between employee preferences as well as needs of the business. It yeah. really sounds like you're um, you know, driving towards a much more empathetic um, model of, of workforce engagement. Absolutely, I mean, it's, I mean, it's been important to be human centered, um, but, but COVID-19 and, and really the, the impacts of that have thrust things further into the spotlight that um, perhaps we're just, I don't know, lower on the priority list, um, but now are, are definitely front and center, um, have to drive that on, have to make sure that 
um, you do that right through every part of that employee life cycle. Again, you know, Nicole will speak to that, but you know, from how we attract the talent to how we onboard folks to how we retain them, and then, you know, God forbid if, if folks do leave the business, um, understanding you know why and what do we do, what actions we take to address them effectively. Yeah, and, and employee engagement, employee expectations have really, we've seen them change. We actually did a different study where we talked to around 6,000 agents globally. We asked them a bunch of things, but one of the things that stood out was that they really love um, learning new skills, learning new technologies. That's one of, two of the things that they love most about their job, and they're looking for advancement opportunities. And so and then considering some of the findings in the MIT report that Clara mentioned, um, one of the things that, that was brought up was that learning and development is one of the biggest areas of opportunity that CX leaders are seeing right now over the next coming couple of you know year, year, two, three years. So there's definitely a shift that goes along with that that we're seeing instead of just productivity focused training, also taking a broader approach to learning and development. So Nicole, question for you, what are some of the onboarding training and learning and development um, programs and the environment at at and And have you launched anything new? Yeah, so great question. Um, the answer is overwhelmingly yes. Um, the, the types of things that I think um, have, have caused us to shift, right? Employees, as, as you've said, they're no longer looking for necessarily a place to pay the bills, right? They're looking for a place where they can belong. They're looking for a place where they feel like they can connect, not only to maybe the peers, whether that's virtual or otherwise, but that they can connect to the larger vision, the mission of the company, right? Like, what does that stand for? And as call center employees become younger in the demographics, right? We know that younger demographics really resonate with things that maybe Gen Xers, et cetera, who were very career you know, focused. They'd stay for a place for 15, 20 years for that stability. Not the same. Right. And, and they really are looking for that place that aligns with what they believe to be true. And so not only do we need to understand that about the changing demographics of our employee base, but then we also need to utilize that information to cater things like training and development. Right. If you are if you are someone who is coming from always on, um, you know, very technology savvy and you're moving into, you know, a corporate work environment like AT&T, that's a very different person than perhaps someone that we hired 15 or 20 years ago. Right. So to the degree that we've not updated training and the way that we connect with employees, the tools that we give to them, then we're not meeting their needs. Right. And, and that disconnect is enough to cause them to go find somewhere who will. Um, I, I want to just, just change tack a little bit um, and talk about the customer experience. Um, we did a big survey that said that the most important uh, factor for a customer when they reach out to customer service, obviously they want empathy and to be heard and understood, but what they really are looking for is a first contact resolution. Um, sometimes as businesses, we focus on other things, you know, the professionalism, you know, the level of engagement, but that first contact resolution, or at least our survey found that it hadn't been prioritized perhaps as much as, as customers find it important. So I want to ask you, how can services organizations, how can you design journeys um, that work best for the customer and the company? That's yeah. A, that's a Oh, go ahead, Nick. You, I'll, I'll go first, Dave, then I'll kick it to you. So this really um, has been a topic of conversation for us, um, even, even lately, in that, you know, we have typically trained employees, if you think about the tools and the systems that we have in a company as large and as complex as AT&T, there's a lot, right? And so the approach that we've used has been about teaching folks what they need to know about those particular tools and about how they interact with process, Right. But the shift for us internally has started to really think about, all right, well, that serves at and well, right? But perhaps that's not the, the best way to approach it. And what if we made a pivot that said we focused all of our training and the way that we onboarded employees um, aligned with the customer's journey, 
right? So depending on why that customer is connecting with at and what is the journey that that customer is going to walk through and make sure that we're training our folks aligned with those various journeys. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback off of Nicole. Mm. To, to effectively deliver a proactive customer care and meet our customers where they are, um, we have to understand where their journey starts, um, what they're trying to do, understand um, then how to prioritize where we would engage them along that path, along that journey, in that channel. Um, there's three critical questions that we have continued to ask ourselves, especially over the last three years, you know, through the pandemic and beyond. You know, are we meeting our customers where they are? And think about all the different channels, right? Our customers, all customers, want to have seamless, interconnected um, experiences across all channels, whether it be digital, calling us, chatting with us, walking into a retail store. Um, beyond meeting our customers where they are, are we enabling our folks to support and be supported in the channel that they're in? Um, and then last but not least, how are we proactively engaging customers, right? So for us, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, our customer, unfortunately, our customers have, have, you know, encountered billing inquiries, billing issues. How can we get in front of that, right? How can we, um, you know, if, if a customer is going online and they're trying to, you know, work through the complexities of our billing, if they have questions or concerns, how can we uh, remote into that customer experience to help them navigate through and answer their questions? Um, if a cut before a customer contacts us about a promotion roll off, um, how can we remove the need or the effort for those customers by proactively reaching out to them? Um, but yeah, you know, when you think about FCR, um, whether it be increasing FCR, reducing repeats, reducing transfers, they all go hand in hand, right? Because number one priority is obviously answer the contact, right? You can't win if you don't play. But beyond that, what's most important to customers is getting their issue, their question resolved. And for us, um, there are things that, you know, there's there's multiple pillars um, that we're, we're highly focused on, right? Uh, number one is simplification, right? Our business is complicated, it's complex. We have complex products, complex tools, services, you name it. And so we've got focus initiatives looking for ways to simplify, to make it easier, not just for our customers, but for our employees. Um, empowerment, right? empowering our agents to do the right thing, right? And again, it's that tooling, it's that training, um, it's making sure that um, how we measure success, how we compensate uh, our folks, ourselves, is also aligned to that. And above all, it's operational rigor, right? Um, inspect what you expect, um, being consistent with our process, our training, our reporting across the board, um, and, and sticking with it, right? So often, like, I think we all, we all suffer with this, right? We, there's a flavor of the month, flavor of the year, flavor of the day, right? But slow and steady, sticking with the plan, the strategy, right? Continue and enhance, make those adjustments. Uh, seeing things through is, is how we're going to be successful going forward. Thank you so much for that answer. And a couple of words that just leapt out at me there, like simplification, uh, empowerment, and rigor. I think there's just so much power to those those words. And yeah, like aligning the training to the employee journey and just really giving the employees that understanding of what, what the customer is experiencing is so important. And since we have a, a question um, from our audience related to the couple of things that we've been talking about, um, let's just pause for that, um, throw this over to you, Nicole. Is the role of the supervisor or manager changing in terms of how they're supporting agents with coaching and training? Yeah, it's a great question, Brittany, right? I won't pretend like we have all the right answers. I, I can tell you that it is it is very much so an area of focus. If you think about, you know, back to some of the things that David said, um, what the pandemic did for employees, both managers and right frontline agents, if you will, it, it for the first time made possible for people something that they probably never thought was possible. And that's the ability for them to sit down at dinner with their children, right? Getting kids off of the bus, being at home when, when important things were happening. And so as we think about the managers, the same things are true. Right. So so part of it is teaching our management teams about how that has shifted with their employees. 
They've got to drive, we said empathy earlier, they, they've got to lead with empathy in ways that perhaps they've never had to understand before. We've got to have comfortability and having critical questions and critical conversations with employees that perhaps maybe from an HR perspective, we, we didn't want to, to touch, you know, but that human touch with one another and that empathy, um, empathetic leadership, those are skills that have to be taught, right? And so we've really had to stop and think about when we've, when we've aligned training, you know, have we included those dynamics? And the answer in many cases was we were falling short. And so we've actually instituted several um, HR type backed initiatives where they are coming alongside the operational leadership teams and having dialogues about words that work, right? What are the things that you can safely say? How can you get more comfortable having just a human conversation, but not be afraid of those things that are taboo that we know we shouldn't be talking about? So hopefully that's a little bit of help. That, that sounds terrific. I mean, it's, you know, you have to kind of test and learn these things, right? And um, I just want to jump over to Ahmed. Uh, he said, empower the employees to try new things as well. And I like that comment for for itself, but I also like it because it's a nice transition for me to talk about something that's not so new, but really a hot topic in the contact center, and that's AI. Um, you know, we found through the, the MIT research that Companies are using AI to various extents, but they really have plans to, to dive into it a lot. They're using it for AI-based coaching and training recommendations, performance monitoring and evaluation, agent assist technology. And if you see in the, the chart that's related to that, um, and we'll drop the, the link in to the chat at the end, um, there are some big skews in terms of where companies are planning to go. So how about at at and how are you using AI um, in the agent experience or in even managing contact center performance? Wow. I mean, um, the shift to digital, right? It seems like we say that year in and year out. Um, I mean, all those key examples that you shared, um, Ginger, I mean, those are all avenues that, that we, as well as many of, of our, you know, my colleagues out there, right, in our virtual conference here are exploring, right? To your point, looking for ways to further enable performance, right? Recommendations on like work process flows, um, recommendations on where to take the customer, drive that resolution, um, customer journey, you know, through all the different channels, especially as customers call into our IVR, uh, driving digital adoption of self-service. Um, if I expand upon, you know, that, that IVR customer experience, we leverage a variety of routing strategies things like affinity, performance-based routing, all in effort to optimize volume delivery and, and help us to uh, achieve our business priorities. These strategies help us achieve a variety of desired outcomes. Um, number one, you know, increasing occupancy for our best performing centers and then connecting customers to the best equipped agents. Um, we have to be mindful, uh, especially with everything that we have gone through together as a society the last few years to not burn out our best people, right? We want to lean on them, um, our strongest, our best performers, but we've also got to be careful not to underutilize, underdevelop um, the rest of the pack. And so for us, it's about effective expectation setting with all parties, all stakeholders, all agents, and then effective performance development. And I think that's also been a shift in itself. You know, Nicole touched on words that matter. Um, in the past, I think we looked at performance as managing performance, but now developing that performance. And, um, and so it's, it's all in how you approach kind of the problem statement. And for us, um, rarely is it one size fits all, and hence why we have a variety of different strategies and different approaches. Some of the things that we're working on, um, to double click further, we're enabling cloud queuing uh, for all of our contact types. Uh, we've been um, doing the groundwork um, for this transformation initiative. We will actually start the migration path early next year, um, and it'll take us all the way into late 2023. Um, but this transformation will enhance our strategic design. It's going to give us further ability to prioritize our call delivery and optimize occupancy, again, for our best performing centers. Um, progressive training and nesting. And so what that means is um, historically, you know, you'd have an, we'd hire an agent, we'd put them through four, six, eight, however many weeks of training. 
They go into nesting for a couple weeks, hit the production floor, um, almost like sink or swim, right? Just trying to paint this extreme picture, right? And so something new that we're going to be piloting, um, and it sounds, you know, it's not earth shattering, right? But it's in essence, as we hire folks, we'll take them through a graduated process, right? Where we'll take, you know, instead of completing all training at once, um, they'll do like a week of training. Then they'll go into nesting, only take calls for those, for that subset of training that they receive, right? Um, so it's very much of like crawl, walk, run versus just throwing them out into the deep end of the pool. And as they go back into training and come back out, do a little bit more nesting back and forth through this graduated approach, we think that's gonna deliver a much better onboarding experience. Um, help them connect with their peers, with their supervisor, help to align expectations, put them in the best position to be successful. Um, so some of the, those are some of the things that we're working on, like I said, to you know help us continue to revolutionize um, you know, post pandemic, but making sure that we're also modernizing our, our ecosystem and enhancing the aging experience. And so everything from enhancing that aging experience, right? And all of the, the, the professional development that you're able to do right through to the customers are having that better experience too, because now the, the agent training has changed and evolved, but also you know, the personalization that's happening with that routing, right? Getting with the, you know, using it for affinity and then getting it to the right agents. Um, that's excellent. And so we have a question from Peter that I want to, I'd love to toss in. Um, could you speak more about orchestrated experiences and maybe an example? And it sounds like some of that routing really speaks to that. Yeah. So when I, and I, if I have the right understanding of like orchestrated experiences, I mean, I think it's, it's looking at it from, both ends of the spectrum, right? You know, from the from the customer end, you think about what is the customer call intent, and so mapping out those customer journeys. Um, number one, it's meeting where customers where they are, right? Where their journey starts. But if a customer is calling into our AT and T IVR, so thinking through, just because we want to drive as much digital adoption as possible, doesn't necessarily mean that's where our customers want to go, right? So got to think very clearly looking at the data, um, looking at customer feedback as to does it make the most sense to, you know, direct the customer down that that Google AI self-service path or get them to an agent, right? Because, you know, because not all experiences should be digitalized, right? Not all customers want to go down that path. Some want and need to talk to a live human being. And so, so mapping that out from there, that strategic design, right? You know, we've been very thoughtful, continue to be very thoughtful. Our functions, our contact types. We look at it from a variety of different dimensions, not just why there's a customer calling us, um, but also taking account the number of interactions they've had with us, right? Are they a repeat customer, right? The complexity of their issue, but then connecting that, you know, connecting those dots to the agents that we have. Um, how we're training our agents, how we're managing, developing our agents. And so um, that's where technology helps us, all of that, right? The data we collect, the analysis that we derive from that, understanding where our customers' expectations are, where they're coming in at, and then the capability resources that we have with tools and agents. And so I know I'm probably grossly oversimplifying what the challenge that we all have to face, you know, with demand and supply and how we bring it all together, but but um but but in essence that's what we're trying to do right so i mean designing those customer experiences like i said requires us to look at both ends of the spectrum and find ways to to leverage the technology to help us do that yeah it's really about understanding those intents and then getting the right resource as you said whether it's technology or whether it's digital or human um, but what that customer really needs in that moment um, so Nicole and David, thank you so much for joining us in the green room. This has been a really great discussion and uh, we've very, very, very much enjoyed having you. This is actually our last green room for the year. So we also really appreciate the festive treats that we've had today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And thank you to everyone for joining us uh, in the green room. Please do uh, like, 
share and tag any colleagues um, that you would like to also benefit from uh, this show today. And we will see you again in the new year. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yeah.